All right, welcome back to our third and final session today. Um, we're going to have a talk on psychedelic science and nature connectedness from Dr. David Luke. So Dr. Luke is a senior lecturer in psychology at the University of Greenwich and an honorary senior lecturer at the Center for Psychedelic Research at Imperial College London. His research focuses on transpersonal experiences, anomalous phenomena, and altered states of consciousness, especially via psychedelics, having published more than 100 academic papers in this area, including 10 books. When he's not running clinical cl dr drug trials with LSD, conducting DMT field experiments, or observing apparent weather control with Mexican shamans, he directs the Ecology, Cosmos and Consciousness Salon at the Institute of Ethnotechnics, London, and is a co-founder and director of Breaking Convention, the International Conference on Psychedelic Consciousness. He has given over 300 invited public lectures and conference presentations on teaching, research and writing awards, organized numerous festivals, conferences and seminars, and has studied techniques of consciousness alteration from South America to India from the perspectives from the perspective of scientists, shamans and Shiviites. He, live, he lives life on the edge of Sussex. <laughs> this is actually David's uh, second talk with us. He spoke with us in uh, at our first ever event in December 2017. So it's an absolute pleasure to to welcome him back here. And I'm sure everyone here is going to really, really enjoy this. So David, um, whenever you're ready, just um, just get going. I'm really excited about this one. Great. Thanks so much, Niall. Thanks for uh, inviting me back again. Uh, big fan of the weekend university. Hello, hello everyone out there. Uh, I can see by your little digits, presuming you're not all just chatbots, uh, I assume there's a lot of people out there. So uh, I'm going to talk for about an hour. I'm going to give you a very brief introduction to the kind of science of psychedelics, very brief, and then talk more about eco-psychology and uh, nature connectedness and eco-consciousness eco and biophilia and how that intersects with what I call transpersonal eco-psychology. Uh, so, yeah, like uh, Niles just gave me an introduction, I'm, I'm a psychologist by training. Uh, I usually say, and probably say it again anyway, is that, you know, I wasn't always a psychologist. I was a screwed up teenager and um, I wanted to know why. So I studied psychology and I went away and here I am decades later and I'm still screwed up. But now at least I know why because I'm a psychologist. Uh, that isn't actually my line. I was nicked out from Robert Anton Wilson, this famous kind of raconteur. She used to be editor of Playboy, but that's a whole other story. Um, but the real reason was because I, I dabbled very much into altered states of consciousness and used my own brain like a kind of neurochemistry play kit and uh, really wanted to understand the psychedelic experience. And so I went away and studied psychology, uh, but was woefully disappointed in, in what you learn on uh, your average um, psychology degree about the nature of psychedelic experiences. And in fact, about all transpersonal experiences. So when you have a psychology degree, you get, you know, all the standard stuff every day, psychology, group interactions, dynamics, personality, uh, individual differences, all that kind of stuff. And then you get all the other stuff at the end of the spectrum, whereby when things go wrong, clinical psychology, psychology, etc. But what you don't really get is all the exceptional stuff on the other end of the spectrum of when things uh, are not necessarily pathological, but are kind of unusual and exceptional. And that's kind of the realm of transpersonal psychology, or what I call exceptional human experience. And transpersonal means those experiences which take you beyond your ordinary, everyday ego identity. Just having a quick check, can everybody hear me okay? Can somebody say yes or no? <laughs> yes, fantastic. Okay, just good. We're still alive. So uh, as Niall said, I work primarily at the University of Greenwich, in London, uh, where I'm based. Uh, I do a lot of research there on psychedelics. Uh, I also do some research when I'm not on psychedelics, but it's, it's not as much fun. Uh, so I try not to do too much of that. Um, and one of the things we've been doing there for the last uh, eight years is hosting uh, Europe's biggest psychedelic research conference uh, every two years called Breaking Convention. Uh, we started out actually about 10 years ago now, 2011, at the University of Canterbury, we had about 500 people turn up. We didn't even expect anyone was going to turn up, so we were delighted. And, you know, not everyone was hippies. Some of them were also academics. Uh, and in the last 10 years, we've now tripled our numbers. It's a three-day event, 1,500 people coming. So that's probably going to change due to the pandemic. Uh, and uh, not just to kind of 
to kind of show off the, the success of our conference, but it has been growing steadily every couple of years. Uh, and, you know, it's becoming, that, that didn't actually happen. That's what I thought it might look like one year. Um, and that, that goes to show that this is a kind of booming area of interest within, within the mainstream academic enterprise that, you know, psychedelic research having been off the table for uh, about 50 years or more is now very much uh, a part of the kind of academic study, although there isn't very much taught courses. Um, but so we literally have kind of research departments and, and research centers looking at psychedelics popping up like mushrooms all over the academy. So, so my particular flavor of, of research is looking at what I call exceptional human experiences, and I've particularly looked at uh, psychedelics and these exceptional experiences because they tend to occur quite a lot with psychedelics when people start to gaze into their medicine bag. So extraordinary experiences like synesthesia, extra-dimensional percepts, out-of-body experiences, near-death experiences, entity encounters, alien abduction, sleep paralysis, interspecies communication, which I'm going to touch on more today, uh, possession and psi experiences. Um, but I'm not going to talk about the vast majority of that stuff. Oh, uh, in case you're interested, that's all been neatly packaged, uh, like kind of seven years of, of research papers on that area in a really fantastic book, several five-star Amazon reviews that I didn't write all myself. Uh, anyway, that's called Other Worlds. So I'm going to give you a bit of an introduction to science of psychedelics. Um, like I said, there was a lot of interest in the 1950s and 60s. That kind of went dormant for about 50 years, and now we're having this massive renaissance of interest. And it's going to be an ever-growing area of research interest, not least because they have a lot of potential applications, which I'm, I'm going to point towards in a while, but that the number of psychedelics has been steadily growing. Uh, in fact, it's exponentially growing year on year. Uh, so being a good drug geek, I, I tried to investigate this, and it was said by uh, the famous uh, Alexander Shulgin, who was like the kind of godfather of designer drugs, uh, that uh, the number of known psychedelics has been increasing by a factor of 10 every 50 years. So in 1900, there were pretty much only two psychedelics that we knew of, uh, nitrous oxide and peyote cactus or mescaline. And then by 1950, sure enough, there were suddenly then 20 psychedelics, more or less. Uh, by the year 2000, there were 200. And I kind of checked back in 2012, and there was something like 350, 400. So we we're on course for this exponential increase uh, by you know, increasing by a factor of 10 every 50 years. By the year 2050, there'll be 2,000 different psychedelic substances. By the year 2100, there'll be 20,000 different psychedelic substances, all of which have uh, subtle, if not very profound, different effects on our state of consciousness. So there's a there's a kind of extraordinary wealth of different states of consciousness we can go into. And a lot of those are derived from, from plant psychedelics, a few from animals even, such as the Sonoran Desert Toad. Uh, but increasingly, a lot of these uh, new psychedelics are, are kind of synthetic or semi-synthetic derived from chemicals we find naturally occurring in nature. So um, the, the basic understanding of, of, of psychedelic substances uh, is that they fall into two major categories, the tryptamines and the phenethylamines. These are kind of chemically uh, structural differences. Uh, so the tryptamine class are strictly similar to tryptamine, which is the basis for 5-hydroxytryptamine, which is serotonin, which is a kind of very abundant chemical in your brain, which is, is, is kind of hugely important in, in a lot of higher cognitive functioning, like decision-making, thinking, memory, and so on and so forth. Um, and tryptamine psychedelics are structurally very similar to tryptamine and serotonin. And that includes things like uh, LSD, uh, dimethyltryptamine or DMT, and also uh, psilocybin, which we get from magic mushrooms. The other class called phenethylamines, which are structurally more similar to dopamine, which is another neurochemical in the brain. And so they act on the dopaminergic system, but also on the serotonergic system as well. And that includes the amphetamine family of psychedelics because there are a class of amphetamines which are psychedelic, uh, such as mescaline and 2CB in the 2C family. And there's lots of uh, synthetic derivatives out there, but also things like MDMA, uh, otherwise known as ecstasy. Now, the neurochemistry and the chemistry of psychedelics would be quite simple uh, if it was that straightforward. It was just these two groups, but there's all these kind of 
additional anomalies out there which don't easily fit into either of those categories. Uh, things like uh, diterpenoids, which we get from salvia, uh, cholinergics, anticholinergics, uh, NMDA antagonists, uh, such as ketamine and PCP, cannabinoids and andamides, and so on and so forth. So it is actually quite complex to try and understand what's going on in the human brain uh, and biochemically uh, with these psychedelics. They also have a, a, right, a wide range of action on different psych, uh, neurotransmitter systems in the brain, but classic psychedelics, like the tryptamines and some of the means, classically seem to work on the serotonergic system. All right, so that's a really super brief um, biochemistry lecture, uh, psychedelic biochemistry. Um, in terms of the neuroscience, there's been a lot of advances made in, in the neuroscience in the last uh, 10 years, maybe mostly eight years since the publication of this paper in 2012 from the team at Imperial College, where I'm also based as an honorary researcher. Uh, and uh, they initially found that under the influence of psilocybin, there was some extraordinary phenomena in the brain which they didn't quite expect. They were expecting that there would be an increase in brain activity in some regions of the brain, which would indicate you know, increased activity they thought would be you know, concomitant with more kind of extraordinary experience. But what was surprising is they actually found a decrease in activity um, in this key region of the brain and no increases in activity anywhere else. And the key region of the brain is called the default mode network, uh, which they kind of somewhat align to your kind of like your ego. It's, it's involved in all kind of uh, mind wandering or kind of thoughts about oneself or other people. Uh, so it's kind of too much attached to your sense of self in many respects. And what they found is under the influence of psychedelics, the activity in this region of the brain massively decreases, um, which they, they, they kind of found to be occurred relative to the intensity of the, of, of the experience, subjective experience, and they put this down to a kind of ego dissolution. What they also found is that this default mode network is also like a kind of control hub for regulating ordinary activity in the brain. So when you, you turn off this part of the brain, you have this kind of slightly anarchic kind of activity going on the brain. So they looked at the, the, the brain data in a different way, and they came up with this uh, lovely graph, which you've probably seen. Uh, so it's a comparison, uh, a schematic of your kind of brain, if you like, uh, whereby the different colors on the outside of the circle represent different uh, parts of your brain, uh, and you know the, the different little circles within that represent even more kind of uh, specific regions within those regions. And uh, you can see on the other side, that it would be your left, I presume. Uh, the placebo condition, we see some amount of activity going on um, just be between very specific parts of the brain. So this is our normal regulated kind of brain activity, or mine, in fact, because I was one of the participants in the study. And then on the right, you see under the influence of, of psilocybin, you see this kind of extraordinary hyperconnectivity where all these disparate regions of the brain suddenly start communicating with each other in ways which they weren't doing before, um, which, you know, kind of helps explain uh, underlying principles for why people maybe have experiences of synesthesia, for instance, you know, this kind of uh, blending together of different sensory experiences. So you, you might see sounds or have colours associated with uh, numbers or sounds or whatever it might be. So pause for a sip of tea. Not DMT, I should just ordinary tea. Uh, and so one of the ways we're beginning to conceptualize the effects of psychedelics uh, across the whole range of different disciplines is that they increase connectivity on, on, on every kind of level. So we can see here on, on a kind of neurochemical level, on a biological level, the increased connectivity between different regions of your brain which aren't ordinarily talking. Not mushroom tea, no. <laughs> this is answering a text. And, uh, but we also see that extending across from not just from the, from the neurobiology, but through into the psychology, the sociology, the ecology, which we're going to talk more about today, uh, and even into cosmology, if you like. So on a, on a psychological level, it gives people a greater connectivity to themselves, perhaps to their unconscious drives in a kind of Jungian or Freudian sense, uh, 
to our underlying kind of traumas, perhaps, or, or memories, or uh, our, our kind of sense of identity, our own personal myth stories. Uh, it also increases uh, our kind of connection with other people on a kind of sociological, psychosociological level, so that we see increases in uh, empathy, uh, increases in compassionate activity, increases in what we call openness to experience, so people become more willing to engage with, with the world outside, the world at large, uh, following their psychedelic experiences. You also see decreases in authoritarianism, so people become generally, as a rule, kind of more sociable and, and more kind of uh, more concerned about their other fellow human beings. We also see uh, on an ecological level, which I'm going to talk about more, an increase in ecological concern, which I'm going to come to. And then finally, of course, people feel a greater connectivity, not just with the environment or their fellow people, but with, you know, the cosmos at large, with some kind of spiritual other, uh, maybe God or whatever it might be, but at the very least with, with the universe, right? So we see this increased connectivity everywhere. And that's a kind of nice analogy of thinking about how psychedelics act. Um, so I'm going to talk about, I mean, I'm duty bound. I don't want to spend too much time on this, but I'm duty bound to talk about, you know, what are the potential risks and harms of, of psychedelics. And of course, you know, back in the 1960s, when there was a lot of media hysteria around psychedelics, it used to be said, uh, probably by the government, that if you've taken LSD three times, you are by definition clinically insane. Now, we don't have to think that particularly anymore. Um, and, uh, you know, the relationship between psychedelics and psychosis has only really been kind of explored in, in recent years in, in any kind of like wide ring population studies. Uh, there's been a lot of research yeah. done in clinical contexts and they, they didn't find any increase in risks of, of, of uh, psychosis or suicidality when these substances were used back in the day uh, as adjuncts to therapy. But now some more recent studies looking at, you know, large kind of randomly selected people across the entire population uh, and they look at their kind of drug use history and their, their kind of mental health, psychiatric history, they typically find that there is, there's, there's a direct relationship or be a correlation actually between uh, people with prior drug use and mental health so that you know, people have more mental health problems if they have a greater drug use history, except for with psychedelics where you actually find there are no greater risk of, of mental health uh, concerns. And in some cases, they have a lower incidence of mental health um, risk indices, if you like. Uh, so, for instance, um, people have lower incidence of psychological distress if they have prior use of LSD and psilocybin. We can't say that the, the psilocybin and the LSD are causing this reduction of, of psychological distress, although it might be. But what we're not seeing is uh, an increase in mental health problems among people who have used psychedelics, which if LSD and psilocybin and these kind of things did induce psychosis and, and mental health breakdowns uh, to any serious extent, uh, then we would expect to see this kind of this can come to light. So on large epidemiological population studies, we don't see an increased risk factors of mental health concerns. And in fact, we do see some reductions uh, and I'll kind of demonstrate that to you more graphically. Uh, so there's we have scientists, we love graphs. And so the dotted line represents a normal population. Anything to the, the right of that is an increase of, of risk across these different indices. Uh, and we see that some of these factors for people who have taken psychedelics are actually lower than the general population. Um, now, I'll just finish off by talking about the risks of these substances, clinically speaking, because they are now being uh, investigated and possibly even rolled out and licensed soon as medical treatments, for, particularly for psychiatric conditions. When these things are studied, we look at the, the physiological risks, the classic psychedelics, not all psychedelics, some of them are physiologically more risky, uh, but the classic psychedelics, like psilocybin, for instance, or LSD, have very low physiological risks. Uh, they, don't, they, they don't have very much side effects in terms of physical bodily system. Uh, the incidences of psychosis and suicide are low, and in fact, much lower than in the general population, uh, and the dependency risks are low. So, you know, these things are technically not addictive. Uh, a good friend of mine was giving a, a lecture at a conference to a room of psychologists about, about this very thing. He was talking about ayahuasca, 
which you may have heard of. And somebody in the audience said, you know, but is, isn't this stuff like addictive? And he said, well, no. And he's an anthropologist, so he spent a lot of time in the field studying ayahuasca. And he said, well, no. Uh, and I would know because I've taken it thousands of times. So there you go. Um, somewhat school, perhaps you would say. Uh, so these substances are not addictive. And yet, at the same time, they can be used to treat addictions with some amount of, of success. Seemingly, based on the, the, the data we have so far, better than most other interventions. So, for instance, a recent study, a pilot study, looking at the treatment of uh, tobacco addiction, uh, or nicotine addiction particularly, with tobacco, um, they found that one high dose of psilocybin, or magic mushrooms, with some psychotherapy, was effective in reducing, uh, well, causing people to stop smoking uh, in half of their sample up to one year later, which is an extremely successful intervention. Now, the real irony of all this, of course, is that, you know, if you, 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 you take a, a substance like a tobacco, it, it's not illegal. You have to be over a certain age to buy it. Um, it's not particularly good for you. Uh, and, you know, it kills hundreds of thousands of people every year, but it, it's kind of legally available. Whereas psilocybin currently uh, is a Class A drug in the UK, which means you can get up to seven years in prison just for possessing it, having it on your on your person, um, it kills precisely zero people every year from an overdose, and uh, it can help you get over your tobacco addiction. Uh, so you know there's something somewhat dysfunctional still, I would say, about the, the the legal system we have around these substances and all that will change. The one thing I haven't talked about yet is hallucinogen persisting perceptual disorder, which I'm not going to go into too much detail. Other than to say there are some genuine risks, although it seems to be quite rare, certainly in the clinical use of these things, that some people take psychedelics and when the drug should have worn off, they continue to have visual hallucinations. Perhaps for years, I'm working with a few case studies which uh, now nine years later still have uh, synesthesia, so they can have colours associated with sounds and people's personalities and so on. Um, we don't know how it is very rare in the clinical population. In the recreational population, it seems to be more uh, common, but you know, not massively so. And it tends to be associated with very large accidental doses of psychedelics. So there are some genuine risks, of course, that these things are never risk-free, but they do seem to be suitable for clinical application. And the, the current kind of uh, clinical trials are showing that they're very efficacious in treating things like depression, uh, anxiety disorders, addictions uh, and the kind of like fears and anxiety associated, associated with terminal illness where people end of end of their life uh, and perhaps within the next three years or so psilocybin will become licensed as a medical treatment because of the success of these early clinical trials we'll wait and see anyways i'm going to move on from the actual background science i'm going to talk more about um the relationship of psychedelics uh, to psychology and ecology. Um, so if you think of these two fields, psychology, ecology, you know, there's a degree of uh, overlap between them. You make a little Venn diagram. And what you find in the middle are disciplines like environmental psychology, which is um, probably the, the, the previous talk is it would come under, I think, environmental psychology, how can psychology be used to... Um, help people become more aware about climate change and those kinds of things, but it also deals with how people interact with their environments and so on and so forth. Um, whereas eco-psychology is more coming from the field of, of psychotherapy and um, eco-psychology is more concerned with viewing human beings as being somewhat alienated by our modern urbanisation. We passed the tipping point uh, maybe only three or four years ago where more than half of the world's population are now living in urban environments. We're, we're becoming less and less and rural and more and more urbanised. And urban environments are somewhat unnatural to our kind of previous several billion years of evolution in that, you know, our, our bodies have evolved to be in nature. Uh, and, you know, you see the incidence of, of mental health problems are much greater in urban environments. So depression currently in London runs up between 25 and 30 percent of the working population are depressed, uh, which we don't see quite so high in, in rural populations. So eco-psychology views urbanisation and the alienation from nature 
of, of modern society as being at the root of mental health uh, concerns. And so the aim of, of eco-psychology is really just to bring people back into nature. Like nature itself is the therapy. So it kind of involves things like, kind of, you know, uh, having a, a kind of wilding fortnight or going, just going off into nature, a nature-based eco-psychology or eco-therapy or psychotherapy, shamanic counselling, and evil, even the kind of encouragement of interspecies uh, relationships. Um, so that is, uh, and its aim is to build a sane society and a sustainable culture. So that's eco-psychology, and that's where I'm more kind of interested in. You can also see that in my area of research, is, is, it deals a lot with the transpersonal realms and people like shamans, which I'm going to come to. So shamanism, uh, so shamanism is an ancient traditional practice, which you know, probably predates all religions, uh, which we still find all over the world. And shamans are people who go into an altered state of consciousness at will in the name of their community, uh, to transcend time and space and you bring back useful information and communicate with the spirits of nature. That's what they believe their job is. And so shamanism, you could see, is, is somehow concerned with nature and the ecology and the environment, the natural environment, and also is, is, a, is a matter of, of psychology because it deals with altered states of consciousness and, and so on and so forth. So shamanism, you could, between these two Venn diagrams, you can see would be fit, fit just as a little sliver somewhere in the middle of uh, probably within the realm of eco-psychology. Uh, there's a few shamans from around the world, just in case you didn't believe me. Um, don't seem to know any of those guys. Uh, and so, you know, according to Jeremy Norbis, this kind of famous anthropologist, he said that uh, shamanism is a nature-based epistemology, i.e., uh, how they come to understand the world is based on their interaction with nature, and it is ecological to its core. Uh, so typically shamans, in, you know, the roles involve things like psychic diagnosis, healing, psychopompic activity, helping people pass through the, the graduation to, to death, uh, communication with the spirits of nature, and so on. But it's very much ecological. So I'll give you a few examples of. So... Ah, before then, I'm just trying to remember my slides. Um, there are, the shamans have many different roles, okay? So, uh, classically, you know, shamans could be considered as healers. They are mediators. They're mediators within their community often to kind of help resolve disputes and so on, but also mediators between their community and the community of nature, between the spirits of nature. They're seers. They kind of get access information from different locations or from the future, supposedly. They're psychopomps, they're tricksters, they're storytellers, poets, dancers, musicians. They are spiritual gatekeepers for their community. And these are their bigger roles. They are caretakers of nature. So they're not only involved with the world of humans and looking after the kind of human realm, but also dealing with, with the demands and requirements and needs of their environmental uh, ecosystem, their, their, their ecological niche. And their kind of biggest role they see is quite literally, they think they are the healers of the world. They, they feel that they're, they're actually keeping, maintaining the health of the planet by, through, their, through their work. So it's no small job being a shaman. Now, the interesting thing about shamans the world over is the different other states that they, they, they access uh, it could be through drumming or diet or dancing or dreaming or death, but that's a one way street. Or through drugs, what we call drugs, but what they might call uh, power plants or medicine or allies, uh, i.e. psychedelics. So a certain amount of shamans around the world, and they can be found all around the world, still, and have done for thousands of years, made use of psychedelic plants to access these states of consciousness and communicate with the spirits of nature. So this is um, a friend of mine, Don Santos, from the Radica tribe, who I've been working with for about eight or nine years now. And uh, here he is doing a kind of ceremony, closing ceremony of psychedelic conference at the University of Greenwich. Uh, and his uh, tradition, they, they are very much, they're like psychedelic monks, if you like. Um, you know, if you imagine like, you know, Tibetan Buddhist monks, you know, there's one in every family. They spend the whole, in every generation of every family, they spend the whole life dedicated to their kind of spiritual tradition. The same things goes for the Radhika. 
they're very numerous. You know, every other person is a shaman pretty much in the Varadic community. And uh, it's not like just one guy on the edge of the village, which you get in a lot of other traditional shamanic communities. A large percentage of the population are, 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 are what we call Marikamas or what we might call shamans. And they spend their entire time engaged in their spiritual and ritual practice of communicating with the spirits of nature. Uh, and a lot of that involves going on a pilgrimage. So this map here shows you their... They live at the very center of this, this kind of uh, kite, this cross, and then they have these four sacred directions. Uh, and this kind of whole area covers, you know, from side to side over a, a thousand kilometers, which they traverse on foot and making offerings and communicating with the spirits of nature as they go to go to their sacred sites. For instance, the one in the West to go and pick their peyote, which is core to their entire cosmology, their way of life and their way of being. Um, so they say, you know, that they only need three things to actually survive, survive, and that's peyote, deer, and maize, which they consider to be their holy trinity. You know? That's at the very core of, of their whole cultural and cosmological uh, construct, if you like. Um, there you go. That's them uh, in the desert. That's a peyote. Um, oh, yeah, so here's a quote from a colleague of mine. He said that, um, I can't seem to get past the, the little widgets in the bottom. I'll have to move this from the oh, here we go. Sorry, muttering, just technical difficulty. Um, so, uh, according to David Lawler, ecologically, during the peyote hunt, which they go on, I mean, they literally hunt it with bows and arrows like a, like a deer because they consider it to be the same as the deer. They hunt the, the, the Weejols are, uh, that's the Spanish name for them. I'll stop interrupting myself. The Weejol is achieve a spiritual relation to their physical environment, not a neutral setting, not a mere place to live or exploit for a living. The very landscape is sanctified the caves, the springs, the mountains, the rivers, the cactus groves, and the features of the mythical world are elevated to a cosmic significance. Plants and animals become only labels, conventions, mere human categories of thought. Distinctions between them are illusory. So they consider man is nature. They consider themselves very much to be part of nature. And I guess this is going to part of the current kind of 21st century human malady is our sense of being apart from nature rather than being a part of nature. And I think psychedelics probably have a role in helping uh, redress that. They certainly do with the Jones. So you can see, and going back to my extraordinary Venn diagram, you have psychology and ecology, and probably somewhere in the, the tip of that, you know, where the intersect, you would have shamanism. Uh, but you also would find what I call transpersonal studies, which includes primarily transpersonal psychology, as experiences which take us beyond our ego identity. But you also get transpersonal ecology as well, uh, which is looking at, you know, going beyond our ego identity. Uh, and somewhere in the middle of that, you get transpersonal eco-psychology, which is kind of like a, a small subset of transpersonal studies, or transpersonal psychology. But I would say within that, somewhere which overlaps with shamanism, you would have psychedelic transpersonal eco-psychology, which I'm very recently named, and there doesn't seem to be many other people doing it, but I think it's a thing, right? So here we go. We've got, we've got more rarefied degrees of... Uh, academic stratification. So my own research into this area, I'm just going to see that. Um, I started off about 15, 20 years ago conducting this large survey of people's transpersonal psychedelic experiences. And one of the things that popped up in the questions I asked was there's a large degree of people who believe after they've taken psychedelics or believe that during their psychedelic experience, they've had a communication, a direct communication with the spirit of or the essence of or the, the intelligence of the typically the plants they've just consumed before mushrooms, sometimes animals or the poison of animals. Anyway, and so they, they feel that like they've encountered the intelligence of another species. Uh, and this was actually you know, somewhat surprising, but it's actually at quite a high degree. So people under the use of ayahuasca, for instance, and this is right at the top. In my original study with a small group of, of ayahuasca users, Back in 2005, 70% of them believed that they had had encounters with the spirit of the ayahuasca itself. 
and then have a kind of communication with, with, with the plant when being ingested. And this is fairly typical to, to most psychedelics. So 42% of people taking any psychedelic believe they've had some kind of communication with that plant or substance, uh, which, you know, just to check that this is just doesn't happen with any old drug, I checked with non-psychedelic drugs, things like uh, coffee, alcohol, uh, heroin, and crack, for instance. And, you know, people don't report those kinds of experiences. Uh, precisely 0% of my sample said they'd ever in, in, encountered the spirit of coffee whilst having a coffee. So it's something very particular to psychedelic substances. And there's a whole bunch of other weird experiences I'm not going to go into now. So I decided that and I looked in the literature and there wasn't any real literature uh, on this notion of psychedelics and eco-consciousness, people being uh, more engaged with nature, more connected to nature, feeling more ecologically conscious after their psychedelic experiences. There was a few anecdotes and mentions of it in the older literature, but nobody had done any kind of serious data collection on it. So back in 2015, I conducted a survey. Uh, I got 150 psychedelic users uh, to tell me about their psychedelic experiences, how many psychedelics they've taken, and so on and so forth, and the kind of ecological experiences, attitudes, and behaviors they had as a result of taking psychedelics. And this was the first survey of its kind. I was particularly interested in the transpersonal experiences. So the first question I asked is How have your psychedelic experiences changed how you interact with nature? And um, as you can see, the vast majority of people, about 75%, felt like they interacted more with nature as a result of their psychedelic experiences. A very small percentage felt like they interacted less, you know, negligible. And a few people, about 20%, felt it didn't really affect their interaction with nature. So we, we see here by self report, people tend to believe that they interact more with nature as a direct result of having taken psychedelics. Um, we also, I was also interested in, well, how do people feel that they are connected to, to nature and to the environment as a result? And 100% of the people taking psychedelics said they felt more connected to nature as a result of taking psychedelics. So that's a 100% success rate of increased connection with this particular sample by self-report. They said the psychedelic experiences have led them to be more connected to nature. I also asked them how concerned they were about nature as a result of their psychedelic experiences. The majority, about two thirds, felt more concerned about nature. A few people, no more, no less, and a very small percentage, 15%, actually felt less concerned about nature as a result of their psychedelic experiences, which is quite curious. And unfortunately, I didn't get to tap into that and find out what the, re the reasons for that were, but it was probably something along the lines of, people feeling that because they're more connected that actually nature has got it all under control and it's probably us we should be worried about because nature will just, I don't know, maybe cause some terrible pandemic or natural disaster and wipe us all out. So, you know, the, the, people's, a few people's concern for nature actually decreased as a result of their psychedelic experiences, but generally people felt more concerned. Uh, I then wanted to know, well, is there any particular psychedelics, you know, plants, fungus, synthetic, non-synthetic, that induce people's sense of connection and concern? And, you know, top of the psychedelic pops was actually psilocybin mushrooms, which would have been my number one guess because there's an awful lot of anecdotal literature of people taking psilocybin mushrooms, like the famous mycologist Paul Stamets, for instance, one of the world's leading mushroom experts, basically saying that, you know, mushrooms... Uh, follow humans around in the wake of their destruction or taming of the land where if we break the ground or cut down trees, mushrooms, particularly psychedelic mushrooms, start to grow. Or through, uh, you know, um, through pastures, through kind of farming and so on. And so he says, you know, and when, when, you, when you take these psilocybin mushrooms, according to Stamets, the mushrooms communicate directly with us and they tell us, the same message that, you know, we're in peril, time is short, and, you know, wake up, you monkeys, you're basically trashing the place. So, based, you know, actually in concordance with what Stamets was saying, the vast majority of people, well, the, 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 the psychedelic substance which was most likely to in, increase people's connection and concern with psilocybin mushrooms, 
somewhat followed later by LSD. And then, of course, as you might expect, you have synthetic disassociative anesthetics, which kind of make you feel less connected, uh, certainly to your immediate environment, uh, actually reduce concern and connection to ketamine, for instance, was not very good at inducing uh, a kind of sense of ecological consciousness. Perhaps no surprise. Um, so, uh, moving on, where am I going next? Uh, so, what I looked at the attitudes of that are being changed by psychedelics, by self report, but also was interested in sort of what behaviors are being changed from people taking psychedelics. Um, of course, two thirds of people said they were more aware of ecological issues. Uh, 58% of people said they changed their diet as a result of their psychedelic experiences. I didn't drill down into what that was, but it probably includes things like, you know, shopping locally, going raw, going vegetarian, going vegan, um, vegan, uh, vegan. I'm vegan. That's kind of vaguely vegan. Actually, very vaguely vegan. Uh, and so on and so forth. But people changing their diet as a result of their second experience. Now, this is the real take-home headline news. I wish... I've got kind of classes on the front of the Daily Mail. You know, you used to hear all these stories about how psychedelics are extremely dangerous and send you mad and all kinds of crazy stuff. Fifty uh, percent, like half of the sample, or slightly more than half the sample, said they'd increased gardening as a result of taking psychedelics, um, which is quite an extraordinary uh, figure. Um, sorry, someone's interrupted and said, um, "What's freegan?" I think freegan is just only eating free food, you know, dumpster diving, roadkill, that kind of stuff. Um, so, you know, 50% of people said that it increased gardening as a, as a result of taking psychedelics. Oh, no, obviously a large proportion of those are probably growing psychedelic plants or cannabis or mushrooms. I guess they can call that gardening. But, you know, people generally feel like they, they, they need to be more connected to their, their food supply and to nature and so on and so forth. Uh, people also took part in, in all kinds of ecological activism, like signing petitions, donating money to ecological causes, uh, joining ecological organisations, becoming uh, an activist, about 20%, uh, adopting animals. And this for me is my favourite statistic, apart from the gardening, is that 16% of my sample changed their career as a result of their psychedelic experience to something more ecologically orientated. Uh, for instance, two people in my sample, who gave examples, said they quit their previous career trajectory uh, to study PhDs in botany, which is a, uh, you know, the study of plants, and which is also somewhat of a, of a dying subject. So people became extremely interested in, in the natural world through their psychedelic experiences. Um, well, I'll come back to that in a minute. So what I will say, since, the, since 2005, when I, 2015, when I, when I did this uh, survey, there's been a, a number of other research papers. We shouldn't have time to stick into the slides. There was another survey conducted by a colleague of mine, Gobins. Uh, uh, yeah, um, Matthew Forsman, who said that um, he found an increase in nature relatedness. Uh, among psychedelic users, that pre and post, that, uh, well, actually, an increase, sorry, an increase relative to the amount of psychedelics people have taken. And he found that uh, the number of psychedelics people have taken uh, also mediated their pro environmental behavior. And it acted on their nature relatedness and made them more pro environmental. So that we're finding that there seems to be a direct link between people taking psychedelics, becoming more concerned with nature and changing their environmental behaviour as a result, although that isn't a kind of causative study, it was just you know, a survey correlational design. Since that time, at Imperial College, Carhart Harris and his team, who were looking at, um, in a clinical trial, where they were treating people for depression, giving them psilocybin by magic mushrooms, they found that even in the laboratory, there was an increase in people's nature relatedness as a result of their psilocybin experience. So, it's not like people necessarily are just going out into nature and tripping, you know, taking some acid in the woods or whatever, and it's increasing their connection to nature. But even people in a laboratory, in a, in a clinical environment, given psilocybin, have this increase of nature relatedness. And that's probably for all the same reasons we find, as I discussed earlier, that we have this increase generally in, in, in connectedness. People feel more connected 
to within their, within their brains, with their own psychology, with their environment. It just increases people's, it just opens people up uh, a gap, you know, to, to kind of increase their sense of connectivity. I believe it's something to do with increasing empathy, which we're discovering, the cares, increases in compassion, incomplete increases in openness to experience as well. So we find this even in clinical environments uh, as well. And uh, we've also found studies now which are looking at people before they take psychedelics in a, in a retreat setting, a survey conducted or um, prospective survey conducted by my colleague Sam Gandhi and, and some other people at Imperial College, and they found that they measured people's kind of nature relatedness before going to a psychedelic retreat, as you might find in Amsterdam, for instance, and then afterwards, and they found that even two years after uh, their, their psychedelic experience at a retreat center, there was an increase in people's nature relatedness. So these psychedelic experiences appear to have long lasting effects on people's connection with their environment. And also, nature relatedness is also related to concern about the environment, pro environmental behavior, and also well being. So, people who feel more engaged with nature also feel better. So, we also find that people get better from having more interactions with nature. Nature itself, as eco psychology tells us, is good for your well being. You know, kind of heal nature, heal yourself. Heal yourself, heal nature, and so on and so forth. So, uh, now, what I'm going to go back to, drag you back to the kind of ideas of shamanism and transpersonal eco-psychology, what I was really interested in as well were what the kind of transpersonal experiences people are having from psychedelics, which make them more connected or interactive with nature. So I kind of came up with, with six different categories of kinds of experiences I thought might occur with people taking psychedelics. Uh, don't laugh at the elves and pixies. Uh, so these were the first one was category was encounters with mythological nature spirits, so things like fairies, gnomes, elves, elementals, and so on. Then uh, encounters with mythological kind of hybrid, kind of human animal, half human, half animal creatures. Now this is a very common motif in uh, particularly South American, Central American, actually North American, actually worldwide kind of shamanism, but particularly psychedelic shamanism. It, it, it's very often thought that the shamanism, in shamans, the shaman kind of has the capacity to wear the clothes of, of different animals. It can become different animals or different species. It's like a kind of trans, transmorphing experience. And, and often in these kind of visionary experiences, you'll encounter these hybrid half animal, half human beings. Like human animals, the, the, the world of nature, the world of humans. Well, the kind of separation and division, the subject-object, breaks down in these shamanic and psychedelic experiences. Um, actually, further down the list, I have transformation experiences. So people are actually having the experience not just of, of perceiving these kind of beings or encountering them, but actually feeling like they're being transformed into another species themselves. Uh, then we're having encounters with animals and animal spirits, uh, encounters with plants plant spirits and intelligences, and then visions of an ecological nature, such as visions of earthquakes, deluges, uh, natural disasters, and so on and so forth. So these sound like some pretty kind of far out experiences you might expect, but when you crunch the data, you probably won't be able to see that, I can barely see it myself, you discover that psychedelics affect your ability to read small text. Um, no, you find that, uh, so things like your natural psychedelic, plant-based psychedelics tend to have a high, fairly high degree of these kinds of experiences. So, for instance, people have taken um, psilocybin, 30 of them felt like they encountered, 30% of them felt like they encountered some kind of, like, intelligent plant life or fungal. You know, maybe they encountered the spirit of, of the psilocybin mushrooms. 20% of them had mythological encounters, encounters with pixies or elves or nature spirits or elementals. 20% of people. You know, you're going to get your friends going off to some, um, you know, mushroom retreat in Amsterdam. You're not really necessarily going to expect them to come back and go, yeah, yeah, I can run into all these elves and nature spirits. But if one in five of them, by these statistics, probably will. Um, and so on and so forth. You know, so ayahuasca, 40%. People had an encounter 
with the intelligence of some kind of spirit. No, you don't need drugs at all, of course, but for some people, they certainly do get them. So, and interestingly, these, these kind of encounter experiences were, were, were much less so with your synthetic drugs, as you might expect. But there's something about um, the apparent or sentience of the, the, the substances you're consuming, which relates to the kind of sense of encountering sentience in the experience. Um, I'm just looking for one other one. Where is it? Uh, transformation experiences. Uh, so, yeah, about 10% of people taking DMT, but like they're transformed into another species, for instance. So these are fairly common experiences, and I think, actually, they probably have uh, at least some amount of impact in people's later ecological orientation from their psychedelic experiences. But that needs to be explored, which I'm currently doing in another survey. So I'm just going to kind of begin to wrap this up with a few quotes and a bit of a just kind of general discussion. Um, so these are some quotes. This is one from Albert Hoffman, who was the original discoverer slash inventor of, of LSD back in 1943. And he said, LSD has given many people good ideas, and those who have gone back to nature have been saved. Many people, however, are still stuck in technological hell and cannot get out. Nevertheless, many have discovered something which hardly exists in our society any, law, any longer, the sense of the sacred. So you can see that psychedelics have that, have that capacity, perhaps, for uh, re-enchanting our, our experience and giving more meaning back to our experience and our interactions with nature. Paul Stamis, as I mentioned, this is his quote, psychedelic mushrooms, he's one of the world's leading experts on mushrooms, said psychedelic mushrooms proliferate in the wake of humans' habits of taming the land such as chopping down trees, breaking ground, create roads and trails, and domesticating livestock. The messages we receive from them is always that we're a part of an ecology of consciousness, that Earth is in peril, the time is short, and that we're part of a huge universal biosystem. Of course, we're a celebrity. And finally, a quote for myself, which is in response to this discussion about, well, you know, if you go off and have an experience where you feel like you encounter the spirit of a plant, on psychedelics, you know, and you come back and tell your friends or your psychiatrist about that, they're going to think you are mad, right? But which is the more mad, communicating with the spirits in nature or sitting back like Earth's ecosystem descends rapidly into the greatest wave of mass extinction in 65 million years. We are currently in the sixth mass extinction and uh, it's happening extremely fast and it's accelerating and it's almost entirely man-made. So, you know, we really are in a bit of a sticky situation. Um, just to kind of give you a kind of scary graph, this is the kind of exponential increase of human population uh, across the last, you know, 150 years or so, 200 years. And you can see the increase in species extinction is following actually a slightly steeper curve. So, you know, I think these two things are, are probably somewhat related. So I'm going to kind of, kind of try and bring it all together. So... What's the good of psychedelics? What role can they play in ecology and psychology or in, or in eco-psychology? Uh, so as I've demonstrated from my surveys and other research, they have uh, a good capacity for enhancing biophilia, you know, the love of nature. We, I mean, to save us from our current ecological crisis, we really need to fall back in love with nature. I think psychedelics is obviously not the only way. Of course, there are many, many ways, but they do have some facility perhaps in helping us get out of a really dangerously, seriously tricky, vastly, rapidly getting worse situation to enhance our experience of biophilia and eco-consciousness. So they can change attitudes towards nature, but not only that, they can change behaviour as well. Uh, and as a result, we also find that that enhances well-being by getting people more into nature, because nature itself is, uh, is beneficial to our well-being and also concomitantly enhancing the environment. So it's good for us, and it's good for nature too. Now, we're also seeing that there's been a lot of peril, you know, the kind of situation with Extinction Rebellion probably terrified a lot of people. And a lot of people are actually, aside from nature deficit disorder, from living in cities and not getting enough nature connection, people are having a lot of anxiety and depression about the ecological crisis that we're in. Okay, so, uh, and, you know, if anyone's read Gel, Gel Bend or Bend, Bell Gendel, Jen Bendel, 
Jim Bendel's paper on deep adaptation, um, you know, a lot of people are reading that paper and are kind of just terrified and depressed and anxious after saying, you know, like the impending ecological collapse is already too late. He reckons we can't even get out of this situation. We better just start thinking about how we're going to adapt to complete ecosystem collapse. So, and, and you know, people are having a lot of anxiety and depression about it. Uh, and I think so psychedelics can also help us deal with our mental health, health crisis, not just from urbanization, but from dealing with ecological collapse and degradation. Uh, because they, we can see they can help with anxiety, depression. Uh, and there's a, there's a movement now, some colleagues, and I'm helping with writing a paper saying that actually in this current wave of psychedelic-assisted psychotherapy, I mean, these things are going to be used for treatment soon, we're urging that we should be able to uh, apply this psychedelic psychotherapy not in a clinical setting. That Actually, the benefits of giving people psilocybin psychotherapy are going to be maximized by doing it in uh, the outside, in, in nature, in, in deep, beautiful nature, um, in the forest, you know, in the mountainside, whatever. And that will find a kind of synergy of, of kind of benefit in psychedelic therapy and nature as well. Uh, we also see that psychedelics can help improve creative problem solving. Uh, I did some research when I ran a, a clinical drug trial Using LSD, we had 40 top-level scientists from Oxford, Cambridge, Imperial College, all with PhDs in various scientific disciplines, most of which had never taken psychedelics before. And we gave them all LSD, most of them for the first time, and got them to work on their own specific research domain problems. Uh, you know, and guess what? All of them felt like they had some kind of breakthrough, some of them some pretty full-on eureka moments. One of the guys was a, uh, a biologist finishing off his his PhD uh, he's actually got a book out, which you can see there, all about fungus. Uh, he was doing his research called Merlin Children. And he was, doing, he was one of the participants in that study. He writes about it in his book. And he was doing this research on the relationship between this one fungus and these two plants, which are all, in, you know, they're all dependent on each other in, in one particular way or not. And he couldn't work out if the relationship was parasitic or symbiotic. Okay? It, was, it was kind of an unknown. Uh, and uh, so in our study, he came to the clinic, we gave him LSD, and he focused on that particular research question. And he said he became the fungus. You know, he had this first hand experience, the first person experience of being the fungus growing inside the rootstock of this plant and getting to experience what it was like. And, uh, and we said, well, what was it like? We said, slimy. And we're like, oh, my God, well, I hope it... It's a bit more insightful than that, but it, it, as it turns out in his book, it did allow him to kind of come to this conclusion that the relationship was probably symbiotic. And you can read his book to find out why it's very good books has come out. So they can help us in, in creative problem solving around ecological issues, concerns about you know, discoveries in biology, but also ecological design, uh, nature interaction, permaculture, so on. You know, psychedelics can help us with insight. Um, we also have the more interesting things, the transpersonal stuff like interspecies communication, which is something that, you know, shamans profess to be able to do. And people commonly report as an experience from their psychedelic uh, adventures, um, which can help re reduce speciesism. You know, this idea that humans are like at the top of the kind of hierarchy and everything else is kind of down below it. We've got to get away from this idea. You know, you've probably seen those graphs of, Ego, you know, the man at the top and all the other species below versus ego. With, they're all in a big circle together and no one is more important than anybody else. We have to be able to kind of engage with nature at its own level, I think, if we're going to avert ecological crisis. We have to begin to consider ourselves as part of nature, not apart from it. Uh, and by, you know, working with these kind of shamanic indigenous tribes, they very much are in harmony with nature, and they do that through a reciprocity. It's all about reciprocity. It's all about not just taking, taking, taking from nature. It's about giving back. It's about kind of living in balance. Uh, and so through shamanic practice, uh, we find there are, you know, for the more advanced, getting to the very transpersonal realms, for instance, in South America, in ayahuasca shamanism, they work with doctor plants. So they take the ayahuasca, they'll dye it, they'll go on an extreme diet of just nothing but plantains and ayahuasca and dried fish for a year or two, and then they'll sit with a tree 
for a month eating nothing but ayahuasca and little bits of bark from that tree, and they'll discover the medical properties of that tree, of the doctor plant. They become the teachers for them. And uh, my own recent research, uh, having worked with these shamans in Mexico quite a lot, is, you know, as do shamans all over the world, whether they take psychedelics or not, they profess to be able to perform weather manipulation, which if you think about our coming impending climate disaster, and extreme weathers. It was 38 degrees last week in the Arctic Circle in Siberia. In case anybody didn't notice, you know, 38 degrees Celsius. Um, the previous hottest temperature it's ever been was 12 degrees Celsius. Okay, we're, we're in, undeniably, in for increasingly more extreme weather, and that's only going to kind of accelerate more extreme weather. Shamans, the world over, profess to be able to engage in weather manipulation. I've witnessed some pretty far out things, and I don't know if I'm going to stories of that. But if, you know, if, if shamans believe that through their use of psychoactive plants, engagement with nature, communication, and reciprocity with the spirits of nature, that they can actually manipulate their elemental forces in their environment, we need to know about that. Okay? But there's something we're missing out on here. So, anyway, I think I just kind of wrap that up and. Uh, we have a short break and then I'll open it up for questions. Okay, so first question is from Aiden. And Aiden has asked, What was your most profound experience taking psychedelics and how have you influenced your life since? So, for question, I mean, um, I've had a lot of profound experiences. Uh, I, I, you know, I couldn't really say. I've got some really crazy shaggy dog stories, which you know I really don't have time to go into here, but um, uh, you might find in my book. So, um, you know, I think one of my most, well, kind of certainly one was quite pivotal, pivotal was uh, having an experience of uh, on Salvia Divinorum of being turned into a, a shrub. Uh, you know, which I didn't expect, you know, I had this kind of idea, well, you know, maybe, maybe nature, you know, plants could be conscious or whatever. It's kind of an intellectual idea, but then having this experience of, of being kind of suddenly paralyzed and then slowly creeping up my legs and arms, I was being turned into a shrub, which when you have the experience at the time is completely believable. You know, you're absolutely convinced of the fact I'm metamorphosed into this kind of spiky shrub Meanwhile, I was outside in this field and all the plants and all the trees, you know, even the grass was all kind of swaying from side to side, laughing hysterically, going, ha, 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 ha. now you know what it's like to be a plant. You know, and here's me thinking, oh, my God, I'm completely stuck like this now forever. And they're all just kind of rolling around in fits of laughter. Meanwhile, this kind of voice kind of broke through, this kind of really powerful, somber female voice going, you, you. And humans, you think you know what's going on around here, but you haven't got a clue. You think you're in control, blah, blah, blah. So basically getting kind of a lecture from this kind of guy in earth spirit or whatever. And uh, it only lasted 10 minutes, but that experience kind of completely turned things around in a way because it, it sent me back. I'd just come back from Mexico, and it sent me back to Mexico to go and uh, investigate Salvia Divinorum uh, and sent me on this kind of wild, merry merry dance of uh, shamanic high weirdness for years but um so you know you can have these kind of profound experiences you know it's one thing to intellectually think that plants might be conscious but it's another thing to be chastised by the spirit of nature and publicly ridiculed by grass okay uh, you know that's the kind of life-changing experience there you okay go. that's fascinating um the next question I, I think it leads well and actually um it's from clara and she says, in the previous lecture, we talked about unconscious attitudes. Do you think taking psychedelics may be a way to modify implicit attitudes to ultimately create behavior change? Yes, although, you know, it's, I think it's the kind of changing behavior is a kind of dangerous area, particularly with psychedelics, because they tried that in the 60s, the CIA with MK Ultra, right? And it, it kind of backfired on them anyway, because they were trying to do it for kind of perverse reasons. Uh, mind control, etc. But yes, I mean, of course, people can come to their own realizations. Um, I mean, one of the things about psychedelics, I mean, that they're, they're not, they are used recreational and they're called recreational drugs, right? But often, if you take a psychedelic substance, 
depending on your set and setting, and it, you know, it can go kind of quite quickly turn into a very intense psychodrama, personal psychotherapy. And it's very difficult to get away from your own shit, right? It's like it, it kind of holds up all your kind of personality defects and issues, and you have a kind of self character assassination, you know, it, it can really point you to the things in your life which you're kind of clearly out of mm. balance with. So, yes, I mean, it will bring up all that stuff. And I think, you know, ecological stuff uh, is, is one of those, right? If you kind of maybe in the back of your mind and consciously, oh, you're a bit concerned about the environment, but, hey, you want a new Xbox and, you know, you're just having fun and all the rest of it. But you, you take a psychedelic, you may well have one of those experiences where that, all that stuff at the back of your mind comes to kind of go, well, what are you actually doing Wake up, you moments uh, is a classic message. So, yes, I think it can help lead people themselves without kind of directing them towards, oh, you need to be more ecological. You know, the, the message inherent in, in those kind of experiences is often ecological by itself. Um, so the next question here is from Jenny. And she asks, how long do you think before psychedelics are available therapeutically in practice and as a psychotherapist? Um, and how would I become trained in working with these methods? Yes, yeah, so um, that's a very good question. So, you know, psilocybin in the States has just been fast-tracked by the FDA, the Food and Drug Administration, for kind of like breakthrough drug status, which means it could be licensed within the next three years as a treatment for depression. Right? And MDMA has also been fast-tracked for post-traumatic stress disorder. Uh, so it could be in the next three years. And, of course, once they become licensed, they have to be then re-regulated because they can no longer be Class A drugs. They have to become under the Medicines Act. Uh, and so then they'll become available to doctors to use uh, off-label, i.e. for non-depression -tre treatment for all kinds of other things. So, you know, you could see in the next three years, uh, psychedelic psychotherapy popping up in the UK and the States and elsewhere in the world legally, right? And doctors be able to prescribe it. Uh, what, so what we're going to need is a lot of psychotherapists who are trained. Uh, getting the training currently is a bit tricky, but there are organisations. If I just throw one into one of the things we've set up uh, in collaboration with my friend Maria Papas Peru, who's a psychotherapist uh, at Breaking Convention, is called the Trip Network, and it gets together all therapists. Ideally, you'd want to be a trained psychotherapist anyway. And then we're going to start introducing kind of uh, psychotherapy-assisted psychotherapy training for trained therapists. We also have a register of trained therapists on there who can help with people integrating their psychedelic experiences because they can't give psychedelics at the minute, but they can help people who have gone off to Amsterdam or whatever on a suicide retreat come back and then help them integrate their experiences. So, um, yeah, in the next few years. And, of course, my mate Ben Sessa, in, in Bristol is just starting up his the first ever psychedelic therapy clinic uh, and he's looking for people who are trained clinicians or therapists who want to get trained as psychedelic therapists as well. That's but great thanks. David, thank you very much. Um, so the next question is from Shirley who was our first speaker, to, first speaker today, she's tuning in for this lecture. Um, is there any contraindications for people with chronic trauma history on are, are there any people that sh should avoid psychedelics, any particular groups? Uh, so I don't know any real contraindications with uh, people who have prior trauma, uh, but then I'm not a clinician, I'm a psychologist, okay, so I'm, I'm not medically trained. Um, what you may find if you have prior trauma is that your experience may well come up under the influence of psychedelics, right? And that's you know, a fairly common thing. So if you're going to do psychedelics, you probably want to be in an appropriate environment. You don't want to be doing it down the pub or at a festival, maybe. If you're going to really have a kind of past trauma, you probably want to be doing it in a, in a kind of held environment with preparation and integration afterwards. <laughs> like, you know, perhaps a, a good retreat centre or uh, and a clinical kind of intervention, so, which isn't yet available except for in clinical research. So, yes, uh, in terms of people, generally speaking, who shouldn't take the psychedelics, I mean, as a rule, in the clinical research, we tend to filter out those people who have, um, you know, mental health risk factors. So we, we don't 
tend to give psychedelics to people who have previous history of psychosis or have family history, first degree relatives of psychosis. And that's only a precautionary thing. We don't necessarily know, in fact, because we don't have the data, if they are a greater risk or it could exacerbate underlying psychosis or whatever. Uh, and it may actually be down the line, become a treatment for, for certain psychotic conditions as well anyway, as happened in the 1960s. But there hasn't been enough research done on that yet. And currently, it's, you know, it's moving forward very cautiously. Uh, what we find is that people who are high in neuroticism, who are more neurotic generally, within a recreational context, are more likely to have difficult psychological experiences, you know, i.e. bad trips, right? But the bad trips aren't necessarily always bad because, you know, challenging psychological experiences can often be quite useful. You know, they may not be very pleasant experiences, but if they're in the right context and they're well integrated, can lead to, um, you know, resolution of, of some issues. But uh, so I don't say, you know, I don't say it's on for everybody, Um those people who are kind of extremely anxious or very close to the experience are probably not likely to have a particularly pleasant experience. And those with underlying psychosis might trigger psychosis. So, you know, those people. So. Okay, very interesting. Um, Carl has asked, do you have any uh, recommendations for reading and learning more about shamanism? Uh, so, well, psychedelic shamanism, there isn't so much on it, so it's kind of quite spread. Uh, my friend Michael Winkleman has written some, some of the most authoritative texts on shamanism in the last few years. Uh, he's uh, an anthropologist. Uh, there's a lot of classic texts as well. Um, so Mercia Eliad wrote a lot about shamanism back in the 1950s, but he didn't talk anything about psychedelic shamanism. Um, Michael Harner's work is very good. He's also an anthropologist. Uh, uh, he's now died last year, I think. Uh, his stuff is very accessible as well. Um, he's a good go-to for the, for the basics about shamanism, I would say, as well. Winkleman is more kind of academically research-focused. Arn is more kind of experiential. And, of course, my mate, Jess Hughes, as well, who runs shamanic training courses down here in Sussex as well. Cool. Now, um are you noticing a big change in attitudes towards psychedelics as as you've gone on? Because you've been doing this work for how many years now? Like 15, 20 years or something? 20 years or 20 so? Years. Are you no a big, yeah, a big shift? And also the second part of the question is, um, is there anything people can do to accelerate this this shift in society? Because I know there's still a lot of like bias against uh, psychedelics and they just they lump psychedelics in just one big category of drugs and all drugs are bad sort of thing you know so have you got any thoughts there yeah i mean i, I mean the kind of consequence of, of prohibition in the 1960s and, and the kind of rhetoric of from that time is you know that all drugs are bad the drugs are bad but drugs are you know not monolithic they shouldn't be treated monolithic uh you know drugs is, uh, i mean it's also cultural factors around drugs you know like the way in which the differences between attitudes towards cocaine and, and crack, for instance, when essentially the same drug are, are kind of cultural prejudices. But, you know, talking about psychedelics, um, you know, they're not addictive for one thing, classic psychedelics, and they have a lot of potential to treat all manner of current 21st century ills, right? So uh, those attitudes have shifted a lot. You know, when I started getting into this area, you couldn't even study anything to do with psychedelics. There's still not any kind of tall programs on it. I, actually, I am teaching a course online uh, as part of a master's degree with the Aleph Trust on, in transpersonal psychology. You can do a module on, on psychedelics and entheogens, but there isn't any other taught courses I know of. Um, but the attitudes have changed dramatically. It was about 10, 15 years ago you saw this big shift and there was no longer any bad kind of horror news stories about psychedelics, but increasingly as scientists were doing the research, that got started getting a lot of attention. And now, we're, you know, it's kind of, you can't, you can't, a week doesn't go by where there isn't some new story about some new psychedelic research, and it's always got a kind of a bit of a positive spin. So the media shifted this, this focus, and I think attitudes towards psychedelics have vastly changed in the last 10, 15 years. And I think in terms of, of how you can be part of that process, I guess it's about um, just talking more openly about these things. If, if you're a psychedelic user, maybe coming out of the closet, you know, 
uh, not in a way that's going to risk your job or anything like that, but, you know, to, to treat it like any other kind of prejudice, like, you know, uh, homophobia or whatever, right? It's like you come out of the closet about your, your psychedelic use. I think that can help. Uh, there was a recent campaign um, uh, about uh, plant medicines, you know, uh, which people kind of put on their Facebook posts of I love plant medicines and that they've helped me. You know, kind of thing. So I think it just, it just needs more kind of conversations about it, particularly with the older generation as well. Um, and, uh, yeah, just kind of bring it more into, into the current dialogue. And we obviously, we put on this big conference every two years, which is kind of getting bigger and bigger and bigger. We're going to have to go partly online next time at least. So, But, uh, yeah, it is definitely changing. Cool. Um, so the next question I want to ask is, what would you say the optimal conditions, both internal and external, are for a transformative psychedelic experience based on what? Uh, yeah, uh, well, optimal. I mean, um, so, you know, kind of preparation, uh, I think. Uh, so, like, you know, do your homework first and foremost. If you're going to go to a retreat center or whatever, check out the reviews, get recommendations. I mean, I'm not, uh, first of all, I'm not advising anybody to do so. So I'd be unprofessional. But if people are going to do it anyway, then, which they often do, then they should certainly do their homework. And that, you know, so all the kind of basic stuff about dose, purity, where's it coming from? What's the, you know, the providence of the substance? What are the effects? How long does it last? What's the kind of the experience like? All of those kind of things are, are key. So know the substance and the environment. Set and setting are also very important. So, you know, the substance, there's three things, the set, setting, and substance. Set, setting, and substance, you know, the substance, the purity, all the rest of it. The setting, where you are when you take psychedelics, typically natural environments are, are the most favoured, like out in nature, but also you maybe want to be around people you trust and feel at ease with and you have some rapport with. Uh, a set is your psychological disposition at the time. So, obviously, you want to be relaxed, you want to be kind of open to it, you want to have some kind of mental preparation, perhaps some fasting or whatever it might be to prepare yourself, some meditation can help. And then, of course, it's so it's the preparation and integration afterwards. It's like what happens with the experience when you've had it, as well as having somebody there who's experienced, who can guide you through, who importantly probably shouldn't be tripping as well. If it's one of your friends, in case, you know, it all goes a bit weird and there's no one straight to kind of, iron things out but then you help you have a period of time in which you can integrate the experience because these can be extremely mind-blowing experiences which can destabilize you you know if your kind of whole worldview suddenly turns upside down uh you know that can be quite destabilizing and that's what we're seeing a lot of people i get a lot of emails saying you know i need help or uh, somebody needs help with integrating their experiences because they went to peru and their their mind's been blown open so you know don't make any life-changing or don't act upon any life-changing decisions within a couple of weeks of taking psychedelics. You know, so you get these people, they go and have a psychedelic retreat, they come back, they quit their job, they sell their house, they leave their wife, whatever, you know, six months later, they're like, <laughs> maybe that was a bit drastic, right? Okay. <laughs> you know? So uh, these can be extremely life-changing events, but, so don't enact any of those decisions you make. Give yourself a bit of time. Yeah, that's, that's definitely good advice. I mean, it can be transformative, but you, you might be being a bit drastic in your transformation. Yeah, definitely. It's great advice. Um, what are the long-term effects of the use of psychedelics in terms of brain function? This is from Gene. Uh, the, in terms of brain function, that's a very good question. We, we don't know too much because, that, I mean, like, there hasn't been any controlled studies looking at long-term brain functions and some studies starting now. There was a big research project in, on, on ayahuasca and they found it didn't seem to have any long-term deleterious effects. Um, and, and some of the things we do know about the effects of psychedelics is that they increase neurogenesis. Uh, so they're neurogenic, i.e. they help increase new brain cells, which is considered to be a kind of positive thing. So that can help perhaps with neurodegenerative diseases and, and even depression and things like that. Um, they are immune system modulators as well. They can uh, positively affect your immune system, although be cautious about that in the current pandemic because coronavirus affects the immune system, gets it into overdrive. We don't really know how that, that fits. Um, 
but uh, they don't seem to have any deleterious effects on, on brain function, as we know, certainly not from, you know, one high dose session. It could be that long term, there may be some potential risk factors. Certainly things like ketamine have been linked to all these lesions, which is kind of like uh, deterioration of regions of the brain through excessive use. But ketamine is, is not one of the classic psychedelics. The classic psychedelics don't appear to have any detrimental effects, but we haven't fully studied it yet. And they seem to have some beneficial effects, such as neuro regeneration. 100%. Well, we've got one more question here from uh, Helen. She asks, how much weight do you give to Terence McKenna's stone deep theory? And moreover, what could this potential evolutionary role of psychedelics mean for mental health and recreation going forward? Okay, so for those who don't know, Terence McKenna's stone deep theory was, you know, whenever it was 200,000 years ago when, you know, we see culture occurring, you know, language, tool use, um, arts, maybe actually the art is more recent, like 70,000 years or whatever. He's saying, you know, that language and, and all these kind of cultural explosions probably came about from our, our kind of um, ancient ancestors on the savannas of Africa, perhaps picking up mushrooms as a food substance, testing it out, having a big psychedelic experience, perhaps developing language through uh, the synesthesia-induced. You know, synesthesia, we have this burning of senses. I've done a lot of research on this. Synesthesia experiences are very common with psychedelics, so you may see sounds. And imagine if, you know, suddenly you see, you can see, you make these ug, ug, ug noise and you see something from the sounds and therefore you kind of associate it. You can start creating nouns, you know, maybe ug looks like a rock and from now on, a rock is called Ugg. You've, you've discovered the name of things, right? That's kind of basically the same theory. You can't really test it. It's an interesting idea. There's some, you know, indirect evidence perhaps for it, but we don't know for certain. But it, what we do know is that, you know, psychedelics and, and all altered states, in fact, particularly dreams, seem to be related to creative problem solving. So they could help in, in kind of cultural evolution in terms of, you know, Auguste Kukuli discovered the benzene ring through a dream. It said that um, Francis Crick discovered the DNA double helix from taking LSD. We don't know if that's true because he's dead and came after he's died. But we do know Carrie Mullis won the uh, Nobel Prize in Biochemistry for discovering PCR polymerase chain reaction where you can replicate DNA strands, which is used in all genetic testing currently, from taking LSD. So, you know, we know that Psychedelics can enhance creative problem solving. They in, enhance what we call di convergent thinking. So thinking outside the box and having lots of new ideas, not necessarily all good, but looking at things in a different way. And they decrease divergent thinking, which is your classic logical linear problem solving technique. So they could be involved in cultural evolution, if not things like language and it's all used in our original anyway. Very interesting. Well, David, it's been fascinating as always. Thank you very much for, for the talk. Um, I think people really enjoyed it. Um, yeah. Thank you to everybody for tuning in today. Um, it's It's been really fun. And yeah, I guess I hope I see you all soon. And David, thanks again, man. All right. Thanks, Niall. It's been brilliant. Thank you very much. Uh, good to nearly meet you all. <laughs> thank you, everybody. Have a good Sunday. Cheers. <laughs> Oh, also, my sister has been doing support today. Uh, just give her a round of applause there. She's been brilliant. <laughs> Thanks, guys. Catch you soon.